So, welcome everyone. My name is Hadi. I have got nothing, absolutely nothing to do with PHP, which means I don't know why I'm here. But other than that, I am. And I'm going to just empty my pockets because I hate doing a talk with my pockets full. And I'm going to uh, give you a small talk on uh, a topic which somebody chose. I don't know who chose this topic from here. One of the organizers. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, Aaron did. Oh, okay. I could have done this for you back in the hotel. Anyway, this topic has absolutely nothing to do with PHP. Zero. In fact, it's got nothing to do with programming as such either. So you're free to go, but you're here already anyway, so I'll try and go as fast as I can. But just to make it interesting for you, instead of calling it where's my free lunch, I know that you're into the whole, you know, the what, what's new in the technology, so I'm going to call it using blockchain for costless and distributed load food provisioning. Right? Now it's got your interest, okay? Yeah. Why? Because well in our industry that's that's how you sell things, right? You slap on a blockchain and it works. In fact, the other day I saw, a, I saw a business card and the title was the Chief Blockchain Officer. I like that, that's how low we've become as an industry. You know, anyway, uh, right, but coming back to our industry, hey, we live in a free world, right? And uh, we get a whole bunch of free services. We get source hosting, we get binary hosting, we get email, we get website hosting, SSO certificates. I mean, if you know uh, about uh, Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt even gives you SSL certificates for free. And the upsell business model is very simple. You use something for free, you provide a paid version with some more features for it, and profit. That generally works, okay? Sometimes it doesn't. Like, for example, I don't want to mention a very large um, uh, Git hosting repository that recently got purchased by Microsoft, but you know that it basically doesn't work. Uh, because you know people use the free stuff on the free stuff and then they go to, to the when they want paid when they want private repositories they go to Bitbucket that provides it for free now if that upsource selling model doesn't work for you uh, the alternative is the unicorn business model and I, I believe they said to me that if I give a talk tonight I get a free elephant is that true okay great so that's mine <laughs> okay so we'll call it the that the unicorn of the business model. So the unicorn business model is very simple. Essentially, and I'll, I'll, because you're all developers, this is Kotlin, but for, as PHP developers, you'll get it as well. I'll try and explain it to you. The way that this works is very simple. You basically create a product or service, you get some users, and then you try and get VC rounds. Right? And every time you get a VC round, you burn cash. You put on parties, you get put on really big conferences. If eventually you run out of VC rounds and you don't go public, you'll write a blog post on Hacker News saying, I created a startup and here's how I failed. That's called the VC business model. And if you think about it, VCs are really, really awesome. I mean, they are. In fact, there was a blog post recently, and I, this, is, this, this talk is actually a few years old. So I, when, when I say recently, I mean like three or four years old. But the great thing is, it's still relevant today. So it's, it never gets old, you know? Um, and it was like, like a selfish love letter to venture capitalists. And in it, uh, Casey Young was talking about how she's really, really grateful to all of these VCs because because of the VCs, she's getting a lot of stuff for free, right? And if she's not getting it for free, she's getting it very, very cheap. I mean, I don't want to pick on, you know, um, you know, specific tools or anything like that. Like we, we make tools, right? And then there's competitors that give you tools for free, but they're selling you something else. So this is all around the VCs and around everything that is being provided, right? And the great part about all of this is that you don't even have to have original idea. In fact, you don't even have to have an idea. I mean, Snapchat raised, well, that was years ago in Series F. I think they were around Series Z when they raised like $15 billion and they went public. And as I said, like Snapchat is very, very simple. I take a picture, it disappears. There you go. And you can get users, you get VC. So I'm like, this is really cool. And all you got to do is you got to come up with an idea that's similar to something else so that people appreciate. Like, you know, it's Aaron B, but for hamsters. Like, that's what I want to do. You know, I want to Uberize cat shaving. Yeah? <laughs> and I'm like, how can I come up with these ideas? So I went to this website, which is called um, Tiff Zhang, and you don't even need to come up with the ideas. It actually generates a website for you. It generates the slogans for you. It has a team tools page, like a team page and about us, everything. You just, you just you sell this to the VCs. And it's great because you'll get some funding. So I thought, okay, but I have an idea because I got a dog. I don't do any exercises and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get my dog and I'm going to go for exercises. So I got my Fitbit and I'm going to create Fitbit for dogs, right? That's a good idea. Fortunately, it exists. 
And that's not, that's not a lie, it actually is this. It's called Fitbark. So I'm going to buy a Fitbark for my dog. Um, <laughs> yes, it does, it exists. Don't say what, it does. Um, <laughs> So we got all of these free services and we got all this free ecosystem to build on, right? You got the free libraries, you got the free frameworks, you got all of this being op open source, yes? Everything is essentially open source. And one of the biggest uh, frameworks to build on is NPM, right? If you all know about NPM, if you've done any kind of JavaScript, NPM is great. It's in fact, it's so great that as long as someone doesn't pull a package, everything works and it's all fantastic. But we don't think about like how are we actually paying for this, right? Because that OSS project that we're paying for, who is actually going to maintain it? You know, we all love open source. We think it's the best thing in the world. Like there are people that that believe that the only true way to write software is with open source. Of course, take about take out the whole open source part, or if you take out the free part, they're like, yeah, I don't like open source that much anymore, right? So is it really the open source model that we like, or is it that we don't have to pay for it that we like? And how long is it going to be for? And what if they get bored? There are people that actually get bored with open source. And you're like, oh, wait, who's going to maintain my bugs? Who's going to fix my bugs? You owe me. You know, I've been using your framework for free for seven years. You should continue to fix my bugs for me. You're like, no, it's open source. I don't care it's open source. Right? Why don't you just fork in and fix it? Are you crazy? I've got better things to do. But, you know, we expect these things from people, right? And... We, not, we often don't think about what happens if this model isn't actually financially sustainable. Because the best, every time you talk about open source, those advocates for open source, what do we talk about? We talk about Red Hat. Look at Red Hat. Red Hat was an amazing example of how you can build on open source and be financially viable. Red Hat recently just got purchased by IBM. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but anyway. And then when you think about the infrastructure, like where's my SLA? You know, right, oh, I'm using NPM. What if NPM goes down? Where's my contract and agreement with NPM that if it goes down? Oh, it doesn't matter, it's, it's free anyway, right? And what about the VC back services? When we're using all of these VC back services, do we ever wonder what happens when the VC wants to cash in? What happens in that case, right? Or even if the VC doesn't want to cash in, maybe the user wants to cash in. This guy wrote a package there was 11 lines of JavaScript. What it did was do a left pad. So essentially it took a string and it did a left padding on it. Like 17 million packages were using this package. The guy got into a quarrel with NPM, pulled the package, the internet went crazy because it broke a whole bunch of stuff. What did the internet do though? What did we do as a developer community? We came together and we created LeftPad as a service. So if you go to leftpad.io, now you can have it as a service. You don't even have to download the package. But the, I, the crazy thing of this is that this package was 11 lines of code and had like 16,000 files for testing, for dependencies, for everything. We've gone a little bit crazy. But we build on trust. We build on Docker. Docker is the most fantastic thing in the world. When we look at Docker, we don't care whose image we're building on or what layers of security they have or they don't have there, but it's really, really cool, right? And people are like, oh, I trust Docker. Do you trust Docker? Do you trust the images that are being built there? Do you trust the software that they're putting there, right? Do you trust the interceptions that they may or may not be putting there? It doesn't matter. It's free. It's cool. It works. And, you know, and then when things go down and people buy things, we, can't, we start to complain. Oh, you know, why has it gone down? Or, I used to use this tool. It was really good. It was called Everything Me on Android. It shut down. It had $35 million raised in three rounds, 15 million users. So the reality is that users does not equal revenue. And yet they sell us this idea that you just get the users and you will potentially get the revenue. No, you need a freaking business model to do that. And of course we have free information, like information is fantastic and it's absolutely everywhere. This is El Mundo, this is a newspaper in Spain, um, it's, it's kind of like it thinks it's liberal but it's not, kind of like every newspaper. Uh, now this is how I see the newspaper, okay, this is how my mother sees the newspaper, okay, because I don't have a, I have an ad blocker, she doesn't, right, so all of this over here, it's all ads. Okay. In Spain, we're really good at adopting technology. We do it like seven years later and we exaggerate everything, right? So they're like, oh, you can make money with advertising. Yes. Why don't we cover the entire content of the page with advertising and we'll have a little title there that's actually the news. I've got a local one because I live in Malaga, Spain. That's my local newspaper. Okay. Like you can't even see the article anymore. The worst part is as you scroll down, 
this damn thing follows you as you scroll down. <laughs> and then when it comes New Year, this is what happens. You're like, what the hell, right? So what is ha some newspapers have done? Like some of them now, you go there and they're like, no, 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 you have to, uh, you have to, you know, sign up to get access to the information. Or Bloomberg is like, you know, you can only read a couple of articles. Telegraph is a very interesting one. The Telegraph in the UK, which is a very kind of like, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to get political, but hey, I will. Pro Brexit, pro Brexit, very right wing. Uh, newspaper said that you can only read five articles a month. Now, generally, after you read two articles on the Telegraph, you don't want to read any more anyway. But let's say that for the sake of argument, you want to read five articles a month. What happens is that after that, it blocks you. So what do you do? You're like, oh, screw this. I'm going to go into incognito mode, right? I'm not going to pay for this crap. You're like, okay, you go into incognito mode. Now, the really smart ones of us, we're like, no, no incognito. I'm going to bring up the Chrome debugger and I'm going to hack that div and I'm going to remove that and I'm going to spend one and a half hours hacking that website so I can read the news. Why? Because I'm better than you, right? The problem is that this doesn't work anymore and in fact what I started to notice with the Telegraph is that the Telegraph started to introduce these things called premium, right? So you would go to the Telegraph and there was like 23 articles and there was this one article that said premium and then eventually the number of premiums grew and grew and grew and grew until now, there's only one free article and everything is premium. So the Telegraph has actually started to move towards a paid model. And you can see this in many other ones, like the Guardian. The Guardian is kind of more like, like, the, like the liberal, like the socialist kind of ones. They're like, you know what, we're, not, we're going to let you read free, but please donate to us. All right? and, and they were really, really proud the other day that they raised like a million pounds because people were essentially donating to them. But a lot of them, what they do is they start to combine things, right? So, you know, this is like a, 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 a snapshot of an article and you don't actually see like all of these over here. You don't actually know if this is news or if it's paid or anything like that. Now, if you look at the stats, it says two out of three young millennials now use an ad blocker. Right, now, the, the problem is that if you use ad block, ad block is now selling ads. So that's kind of like an issue there. So you're not going to be safe with using an ad blocker. But so they've come up with a new system which they call uh, native advertising. So if you take a look at this, this is really easy. Like, you know, you can see that there's an article and there's a big advertising from booking.com. So everyone is clear that it, this is essentially an article and there's an advertising that's being paid for on the side. Now, if you come here, you start to see things that start to merge, right? And they call this native advertising, which essentially means I have a very small section that sometimes I may call sponsored features where people are writing articles that essentially are advertising. But it's so indistinguishable from the actual content that you don't know if this is true, if this is honest, or if it's just paid advertising. So if you think about it, we are essentially paying by degrading the quality of information. We're essentially ending up in a system where we are getting clickbait articles. That is the value of what we're getting, right? And by blurring the lines between marketing and news, we don't know anymore if what we're doing is actually real news or if it's kind of like just marketing. But you say, well, in a world of social media, traditional media has become irrelevant anyway. Right? Because social media, if you think about it, has given us all a voice. Like, I don't need to go to the website of news anymore to find out that there's a hurricane somewhere because I see it on Twitter first. Right? I go to trending topics. Oh my God, there's a hurricane. Where is it? Okay, it's like 10,000 miles away from me, but let me pretend that I actually care. And I'll get to that. Because news is actually crowdsourced, right? And the problem with the news that is crowdsourced is that we've eventually also created a kind of system in which, depending on where you are, you get a certain kind of news and certain kind of crowdsourcing. So if you're on Snapchat, it doesn't matter, the news disappears in a couple of minutes. If you're on Twitter, okay, Twitter is more or less okay. Facebook, let's not even go there. And Google Plus, well, no one was there, so they shut it down, right? <laughs> Literally, no one was there and they shut it down. So. Mark Zuckerberg, right? Mark Zuckerberg comes up on and says, and this is quite old. It says like, you know, Facebook stands for, I, I've highlighted it. Facebook, that has the power to share your thoughts and experience. That's what makes social media unique. We are one global community where anyone can share anything from a loving photo of a mother and her baby to intellectual analysis of political events. Now, I gave this talk way, way, way before Brexit and way, way, way before um, this other election that happened in another large country that's 
over on the other side of the world. I'm not going to mention it. Uh, and, but the interesting thing was that you could, show, you could share everything from a photo of a loving mother, except, of course, Facebook will ban a photo of a man cradling a sick son because it's wrong, right? But here's the thing. We heard about this. It made the news, just like this one. Yes, someone posted a picture of the war in Vietnam, and guess what? They banned it, and a newspaper in Norway got wind of it and said, this is bullshit, and I'm not going to allow this, and they started to create some noise, and they start some shit, and Facebook said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Now think about how many times they have banned things, they have censored things that we haven't actually heard of. Yeah? And how many times news that should have been out may not have been out because we didn't get it in our personalized feeds. Think about that. And they say, no, but it's the information that you need. Introducing timelines and moments. All of them do this, right? Like giving you the information that matters most to you. It's about your needs. Showing what you care about first. Yes? How do you know what I care about first? Oh, we've got this amazing uh, analytics and machine learning that is telling us exactly what you care about. You know how many times I hit like on Twitter? Never. Do you know why I don't hit like on Twitter? Because I don't want them to know what the hell I like or I don't like. Right? Do you know how many times I hit like on Facebook? Never, because I quit it five years ago and I deleted my account. You should too. Promise you. Twitter, uh, Facebook, if, 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 if... By the way, does anyone work for Facebook here? <laughs> Okay, anyway, trying to. trying to, you don't want to do that, right? So you start to wonder like who actually is in control? Who is in control of the information that you're seeing? Is it a person? Is it a machine? Who is it? And the more we're feeding these machines, the more essentially what's happening is that we're ending up in our own actual bubble, right? Because we are saying this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want to see. And then, of course, there are bubbles that drive us in a specific direction, which we'll get to. And then, of course, you have fake news, right? The good thing about fake news is really great. Because, like, sometimes people come up to me and they say, like, hey, you know, I've read this article about Kotlin, right? Kotlin is our programming language. I read this article about Kotlin and it says this. What are your thoughts on it? If you don't agree with it, you just say, oh, no, that's fake news. It, it works great, right? You can now just say everything's fake news. <laughs> and... So there's something to, ha to, to thank Trump for. Uh, so you have the, you know, the rise and rise of fake news. And what are, the, what are companies doing? Like Google saying, oh, don't worry about this. We got it under control. We're going to define what is and what is not fake news. Oh, really? So the biggest advertising platform on the world is going to tell me what is fake news and what is not fake news. <laughs> Who's going to decide that? Oh, our machines. Oh, our people. It just, like, do you, do you realize the problem here? We are putting our hands on deciding what is fake and what is not fake into other people's hands. So who's responsible for fake news, you say? Well, this is like, this is wrong, right? Here's the problem. Uh, you know, the, the corporations are bad and, and any, any news outlet that you don't agree with is fake news and other people are responsible for fake news. It's not us. But what do we generally do? What do we generally do when we are on Twitter or on Facebook or on other things? Right? So we see some news. Yeah? And we like, oh, you know, uh, tsunami in, I don't know, or whatever, anything. Like, you know, Hardy has jumped off an elephant and broken his leg. And you're like, I'll share that news. Yeah? And then what happens is you forget about the news. That's generally it. Yeah? But what we see less often is, oh, you know what? I'm going to see some news. I'm going to contrast the news with multiple different input sources, dig down, validate the news, and only if I see that the news is true, then will I share the news. Like, we don't do this. How many of you are on Twitter? Yeah, you see a tweet. Some of us don't even bother looking at the thread of the tweet that says, you know, oh, you know, elephant is flying. One underneath, this is fake news. Next one, this is totally fake. No, screw that, we'll just share it because it's awesome, right? <laughs> and we do this, why do we do this? For multiple reasons. First, we don't have time to contrast and fact check everything. Second of all, a lot of it is about confirmation bias, right? If I don't like a political candidate, if I don't like a specific act, if I don't like a 
specific technology and I see something that aligns with my mentality, with my thought, what will I do? I will share that and I will pr announce and I will promote my ideas without actually thinking about, hey, maybe I should take a step back and contrast this. Maybe I should think about the other side. Maybe I should see the other angles of this. We don't do that generally. So we are very part of this whole system that is promoting and sharing fake news. And then what do we do? We blame others. Yeah? And where is our balance in judgment when we see some of this news? What it be, and when I'm talking about news, I'm not talking about specifically political news. I'm talking about anything that could potentially come up. Because we've essentially what we're doing with, with this sharing and stuff is we're creating these walled gardens in our own bubbles. Right? I mean, if you look at Facebook, if you look at Twitter, if you look at all of these social medias, generally, are you following those that you strongly disagree with? No. We're following those that we strongly agree with. So what are we seeing? Every time we're seeing our own point of view. Yeah? And then when someone tweets something of someone that we strongly disagree with, what do we do? We destroy them, right? And we ridicule them and we hammer them. Why? Because we're only seeing one side of the story. In fact, there was a very good paper that was written that was saying that reducing controversy by connecting opposing views. That the idea that if I can actually start to see opposing views, I can reduce controversy and I can reach better understandings. But you say, it's impossible. It is impossible for us to do this because there is information overload. Like there is so much information nowadays that I can't possibly sit down and analyze everything that comes to me. It's just easier for me to just share and forget about it. Now, how many of you are familiar with Orwell, George Orwell, right? He wrote a book. Um, it was called what? 1984, right? And in it, George Orwell was, was talking about like Big Brother, where you had like everything was controlled by the governments and there was someone that was always watching you and there was always control and there was censorship. Now, there was also this guy which called um, Aldous Huxley. Anyone read this one? It's called Brave New World. Now in Brave New World, he talked about controlled population where you had artificial uh, procreation, you had amusement, everyone was always like entertained and amused and there was like drugs and sex and everything and it was just awesome and it was just wonderful and those that were mentally capable, that were fit, would make it through the population. The other ones, well, let's just pretend they didn't. Okay? And there's another book, because we'll come back to Aldous, there's another book which is called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Anyone read this? Very good book. It's by uh, Neil Postman and in it basically he talks about the era of TV and how TV has essentially created an information overload and he goes back to the time of how this all came about and like I gave you the example of you know uh, uh, an event that happened 10,000 miles from me yes before something that happened 10,000 miles from you you didn't give a crap about it didn't impact your life, you didn't give a crap about it. But now we do, why? Because the Telegraph started to introduce this concept of news from abroad. And then that was amplified with TV and with radio, etc. And now we start to get so much information that we just listen, get entertained and move on. None of us listen to the news because we care about what happens on the other side of the world. We may pretend we do, but we generally don't. We listen to it because it's entertaining. Right? It's become info entertainment. And nowadays it's become even worse with the internet and with social media. So what Neil Postman was saying, and I, and I will read this, it was like he said, what Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was those that would, there would no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Kind of similar to now. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information, while Huxley feared those who would give us so much information that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. We're getting so much information now that the relevant is becoming irrelevant. Huxley feared that Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelings, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumple puppy. In short, Orwell feared that what, would we, what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love would ruin us. This book is about potentially Huxley being right, not Orwell. 
Unfortunately for us and Neil Postman, he was wrong because they're both right. We have ended up in a society where we get the best of Orwell and the best of Huxley. If not, take a look at Instagram and take a look at certain countries. And you think about it and we're basically paying for all of this information overload by sacrificing our time. And we're creating a very, very, very unhealthy environment, right? Where we've fostered this idea of culture of share. And I'll give you a very typical example. How many of you have heard of a lady that got on a plane many years ago and she was boarding a plane in Heathrow, right? And she tweeted, she goes, I'm getting on a plane to South Africa. I hope I don't catch AIDS. And then she wrote, I'm just kidding, I'm white. Anyone heard of that story? Okay, so this lady got on this plane and she got on this eight hour flight and she landed. And when she had landed, she was trending topic in the world. And this woman had like maybe like 50 followers. She was trending topic because someone took this and started to share and share and share. Cut a long story short, her life was destroyed. She was a PR of communication of a very large group. Um, probably not the best thing to tweet anyway. Now, her life was completely destroyed. People started to share, what a, what a bitch, what an asshole, how insensitive, people are dying of you know, AIDS, blah, blah, blah. Nobody stopped to think maybe she was being sarcastic because hell, that, is, that could be a very well sarcastic tweet. Now, I don't know if it was sarcastic or not, she does. She says it was sarcastic, no one will ever know. But, you know, someone tweets that, that could well be sarcasm. But the point is that nobody remembers her anymore. Her life, because of a tweet, was destroyed and she spent three years of her life living on people's couches, afraid to be online, she never managed to get a job, anything. She's now a waitress in some town in the US and we've forgotten about it. And yet we were one of the people that started to share and forget. And we've created this industry, we've created this thing where whatever happens, we start to share. We don't contrast information, we don't look at facts, we just share. And we share when we forget. Just like we were two, 10, 20 years ago, we were reading the news about how there was some earthquake somewhere, we heard about it and we forgot about it. This is what we're doing now with social media. It's ba but the worst part is, it's being amplified even more. And we're not caring anymore about the truth, we're not caring about the facts. Why? Because there's so much information, we don't even have time to care about it. And we are making basically the irrelevant very much relevant. And the things that are meant to be relevant have become essentially irrelevant. Yeah? And that's what free information has given us in society. And of course there's free applications. Anything that you could potentially think of, there's an app for that as well. What do I eat? There's an app for that. Right? Anything. There's an app for telling me what do I eat. When do I exercise? There's an app for that. It's called Fitbit. Right? I know exactly how much I exercise, I know exactly how much I sleep, I know everything. When do I work? There's an app for that. There's an application, in fact, I use, it's called Focus, right? Focus is really cool. You basically install it on Mac OS, that you will never be able to get rid of it. And essentially what it says is, I'm going to focus for 20 minutes. And then what it does is, in those 20 minutes, you can set a timer, in those 20 minutes, it won't allow you to go to YouTube, it won't allow you to go to Hacker News, it won't allow you to go anywhere. Right? Back in the old days, we used to have an app for that as well. It was called Discipline, but now it's called Focus. You know, where do I go? Everything is tracked. I get online, I, I land in, in Gatwick, and like I've got, I've got what, it, what is it called, TripAdvisor installed. i got TripAdvisor installed. I land in Gatwick, it says to me, hey, welcome to London, do you want to go eat somewhere? I'm not even logged in, like I don't even have you launched, and you know exactly where I am. And one of the best ones is Google. Right, Google, Google is amazing. Like Google tells me absolutely everything. It knows where I'm going, it knows where I've been. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, recently, a few years ago, and I've even recommended this to my colleagues, I installed an app called Your uh, Google Trips, right? Google Trips was amazing. I installed it on my application. I'm like, okay, let's see how this works. I click okay, it says, do you want to associate this with your account? I'm like, yes. Immediately, like literally, in a matter of two seconds, I had all of my trips categorized for the past 15 years, right? Why? Because Google had all of that information. All they did with Google Trips was provide me a new user interface. Every single email was stored in Google for 15 years. 
In fact, I came to Singapore back in 2003. It had that information as well. Which hotel I'd stayed in, my flight, everything. Try it for yourselves. It's fantastic. And I mean that in a very sarcastic way. But <laughs> point being that all of this information is completely and totally available. And it's all there. And why? Because we got it all for free. Yeah? And of course, your assistant knows you. Like Google knows you. And now with some devices, they want to know your family too. Uh, how what is called is Amazon Echo, right? Or Google Home, or all of these are now wanting to be part of your family and know exactly what you can do. You can call it OK Google, you can call it Hey Siri, you can call it Yo Alexa. Notice that I don't have Cortana in there because nobody really talks to Cortana. <laughs> And the best part is that other industries are saying, this is a really good idea. Let me create an Alexa for kids. Yes, because what's the best thing we can do with our children? Put a device that sits there and monitors them when they're like four or five years old. Right? I mean, you imagine for a moment if someone says to you, hey, you know what, I'm going to come to your house, I'm going to install video cameras everywhere, and I'm going to put microphones everywhere. Are you okay with that? And you're like, are you crazy? Piss off. Right? And then Google Home says to you, hey, do you want this device? You're like, oh my god, I get it for free. It's awesome. Right? <laughs> And, I'm, and, it, and it, what is it doing? It's listening to every conversation you have. It's listening uh, to uh, seeing everything. It's absolutely there. In fact, if you go to your Google history, you can see all of the recordings. If you have OK Google installed on your phone, it's got all of the recordings there. Why? Because it's listening all the time. And then it will dump anything, hopefully, right? Hopefully. And then no one else can get access to it, hopefully. But of course, you may have heard that Amazon was shipping files to those that they shouldn't have. And when they're not listening, they're listening. If not, look at the pictures that they have of uh, Mark Zuckerberg that he's covering his own microphone and his own camera, <coughs> right? So, you know, Amazon Alexa's recorded private conversation and sent it to random contacts. There you go. Yes? Runkeeper is keeping track of you secretly even when you're not using it. There you go. You see, these are the things that make the news. But there's a ton of other things that don't make the news. Facebook will put its data collection VPN app from the App Store over privacy concerns. In other words, Facebook has a VPN app and it allows you to connect to VPN, but guess what? It's collecting data through all the apps that you're using, right? I tell you, I'm not going to mention the company, but there's a company that has been on the slides numerous times. It is evil. So, and then of course, what we're doing is now we're saying, you know what? This is really, really cool because everything can be connected and with the Internet of Things, everything will be connected. Right? I mean, it reaches a point like, why the hell do you want some things connected to the internet? Like, LG wants to put Wi Fi in every appliance. I mean, you think about that. Think about that, you know? And then you combine this with hackers, and it's like, yeah, you know that toast, the bread that's in the toast? I'm not going to pop that shit up until you pay me 10,000 bitcoins. Mind you, nowadays you don't want bitcoins because that crashed. Um, I hope nobody bought bitcoins. But anyway, and why is all this? Because ads sell. Ads sell. At, apparently. In fact, we were discussing just easy, earlier how marketing always sucks. How many of you like coffee? Right? How many of you like Starbucks? Yeah, exactly, right? It's like one of the shittiest coffees in the world, and yet it's one of the most successful brands in the world. Why? Because of the feeling, because of the marketing, all of this around it. But ads sell. So we went from the idea that I can have a billboard, right? Where I can send, you know, we went from marketing where I have a billboard that says, McDonald's 50 year anniversary that was targeting everyone no matter if they were vegetarians, if they were vegans, if they were meat lovers, if they hated hamburgers to what we call personalized experience. We went from creating advertising that will target you no matter who you are to no, let us cater to your personal existence. We know what you do, we know where you work, we know how much you work out, we know how much you eat, we know where you travel, and we'll collect all of that data and we'll provide you personalized experiences. Right? No. Let me give you another word for personalized experiences. It's called manipulation. Right? And just the same way they're manipulating us for things like advertising, well, guess what? They can manipulate us for other things. I don't know. Randomly, let me think of something. Oh, yes, political voting. Oh, there you go, right? And suddenly, everyone's shocked. Holy shit, are they manipulating us to vote for a party? Well, you think about it. They're manipulating us for you to buy a fridge, even though you bought a fridge a million times. Amazon still says, hey, I see you looking at the fridge. Yes, I bought it already. Doesn't matter, buy another one. <laughs> 
Bruce Schneier famously said that surveillance is the business model of the internet. We build systems that spy on people in exchange for services, corporations calling it marketing. That's essentially what we have created in this industry. But you say, I don't care. Like, I have nothing to hide. Yes? Right? I don't care if they sell me a fridge. Why would I care? Well, I'm not a big fan of this guy, but he said, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. And that is very, very true. You say, well, big deal, I see some ads. The problem is, it's not just about ads. It's not just about that you see some ads. Like, for instance, the US government starts asking for foreign travelers to disclose their social media accounts. If you don't disclose it, it's optional right now. If you don't disclose it, nah, it's not like we're going to hold it against you. No, but we will hold you a couple of hours and ask you why you're not disclosing your social media accounts. Just recently, in Spain, believe it or not, our data protection agency passed a law in which it said the government, sorry, political parties are allowed to collect information online from people's social media accounts to determine their political views and then target them with spam. This is in the same country that belongs to the EU that from the flip side is trying to protect people's rights of how and when you can use data. And the, our data protection agency said, yeah, this is okay because it's not about advertising, it's about politics. <laughs> oh, suddenly now, you know, the one sacred thing that was like voting was private, now you're going to target me. <clears throat> now, I'm, I, I'm sure you've heard of another country that has this rating system. Now in China they have this rating system, which essentially says you can basically, everyone has a social score. Have you ever heard, seen Black Mirror? Right? Remember that episode where, well, that's already a reality. In some countries, that is already a reality. And it's not about who will have your data, you know? It's about, like, what will they do with it and when they have it. And we are, of course, confining in that no one will ever get hacked and stuff like that. And what about the privacy concerns? I even, in fact, asked, like, you know, they say, oh, the privacy policies will protect you. Yes. The majority of us don't even read the privacy policies. Like, most of us have automatic updating in place and we don't even read the privacy policies. In fact, there was a, a company that does a VPN software. They put up a privacy policy in the UK. They did this as an experiment. They gave free Wi-Fi in a park, right? And in the privacy policy, there was a clause that says, in exchange for free Wi-Fi, you will give us your firstborn, right? They had like 20,000 people use their Wi-Fi. Only one person pinged them and said, what is this about me giving you my kid? <laughs> one person, right? And it was just an experiment. We don't care. Like DNA123 and me, or whatever it's called, DNA sites that you send your DNA and they check your ancestry. Oh, behind at-home DNA testing companies sharing genetic data with third parties. Whoa, I didn't see that coming. And imagine that those third parties are now insurance companies. And I imagine those insurance companies say, hmm, you don't look too good for me giving you some insurance, right? So I use an application on my phone. It's really, really cool. Every time I go to a beer place, I check in my beer. It's called untapped. Right? I don't know if you've heard of it. It's really cool like, because I can see what other people are drinking and that. And I'm just waiting for one day some insurance company saying, you're drinking way too much here, my friend. You know, we're not going to give you insurance. But that could potentially happen. Roomba, Roomba, the little thing that, re that cleaned your house was trying to send maps of your house to calling home, right? And you're like, yeah, what about GDPR? GDPR is going to protect us. No, GDPR has put a big ass banner on your front page and says, oh, would you like to consent to all of this shit? And you're like, yeah, whatever, just get rid of it. That's what GDPR has brought us. And if you think about it, we're basically paying by being the product. We've heard this a million times, and yet what do we do? We are still the product. We're like, oh, screw it, it's really, really cool. Let me continue to be the product. But we don't think about what happens with the data and who's going to get hold of that data. And we're essentially sacrificing our privacy for convenience. This is really cool. Google Trips is really cool. It doesn't matter that Google knows everywhere I go. It's really cool. It's really convenient. It tells me if there's a gate change. Because they've made things so convenient for us, we're essentially saying, you know what? Own me. It's okay. I don't care. Have all my data. And what we're basically saying is that we're hoping that this data won't be used against us, ever. 
And we don't know that. We won't ever know if data will or won't be used against us. Now, I don't know if this is a true story or if it's a myth, but it, it's kind of feasible. And I tried to look it up and I did find something similar to what was said. But there was a, um, I was listening to someone recently and they were telling the story about uh, back in the old days in, around the 1940s when there was World War II, uh, you know, the, the Germans went to Holland, right? Now, in Holland, the town hall used to have a lot of maps of you know garbage collection right and they didn't have and they had different routes and there was a lot of there was a big jewish community there with a lot of jewish businesses etc so they used to have the routes for when they pick up garbage for the for the jewish um, shops why because they would work different days of the week right so when the germans in many did guess what they did there you go right point being Information that may seem harmless today may not be harmless tomorrow. Data that you are giving out today thinking, hey, this is completely harmless, may not be that harmless tomorrow. So to sum up, and you know, I just want to wrap up because we are running out of time. I'll make it very, very short and sweet. We are literally screwed. Like, the, if you thought that this is going to end on a high, it's not. It's going down low, lower and lower. And as we finish this talk, you'll be like, just whatever. Just We'll all lie on the floor and we can mutually kick each other. Now, the bad news is that this is not an episode of Black Mirror. The good news is, there is no good news. We are really screwed, okay? And the problem is that it's not getting easier. Right? This is not getting easier. If you think about AI, people say, oh, AI, AI is great. AI, no, AI isn't going to come and kill my job. Right? This, this is a common thing. People, when they say, oh, AI, no. Do you remember the Industrial Revolution? Yes, AI is another Industrial Revolution. Right? It's going to create more jobs. No, actually, I don't believe it does. And many studies believing it does not create jobs. AI is actually destroying jobs at a much higher rate than it is creating quite different to the Industrial Revolution. If you don't believe me, read an article and numerous papers from MIT. And I just have to say MIT and you'll buy it as fact, right? Because MIT is MIT. But it's not only about jobs, AI is also about influence. Again, look at the date on this, right? February 13th, many years ago. I don't know when it was, but it was many years ago. This was before the election in the US. I read an article on why the, the rise of weaponized AI propaganda. And this article made reference to a, co to a company that nobody had heard about. It was called Cambridge Analytica. Oh, you've all heard about Cambridge Analytica now, right? Yes? If I can use AI for selling you soap, I can use AI to tell you who to vote for, right? And AI, of course, you've seen that it can help fake Spread, uh, spread fake news because it essentially, you know, there's, there's applications now that you can basically download on your app and say, oh, I want to put this face and this face, I want it to say certain things. And this is really getting kind of crazy, right? But AI drives revenue, right? Algorithms are essentially trying to engage us more. And we're basically creating this divisive and extreme content that is more engaging. Try it. My kid loves um, watching some videos on YouTube. I shit myself when he goes on YouTube because he starts with a video of like, you know, you know, he may like Fortnite. Okay, he's starting with a video of Fortnite, right? Or in fact, he loves sharks, right? He loves everything to do with marina, biology, etc. So he, he starts to view like some videos of, and he starts, to, I, I Google for him like, you know, um, sharks, the largest shark in the world. And he starts to click on the video of the sh largest shark in the world. And the next one is like, you know, uh, shark, Comparison of the most dangerous sharks, clicks on the most dangerous sharks. Then the next video is like, shark destroying a boat, clicks that, shark destroying a boat. Then, shark killing a person. And if you actually look at the algorithms of YouTube, it is driving you always towards extremism. Just look at it yourself. Start to watch YouTube videos and start to see how it starts to pop up videos that are controversial, videos that have a lot of plus negative comments, videos that are, have a lot of thumbs up, thumbs down, because it is driving us to controversial content. Why? Because controversial content is more engaging. The more we spend time on YouTube, the more we spend time clicking, right? So we're leading to this dystopian 
civilization because someone said clicking on ads will provide us with a personalized experience, right? Because clicking sells. And the more views you get, the more airtime you get, the more generate, the more revenue you gener generate. And what are our algorithms focusing on? Driving us with engagement at whatever cost it may be. And what's worse about all of this is that all of these algorithms are also biased, right? Because if you think about it, people often naively think, oh, you know what? Here's how we solve bias in the world. We'll have computers decide. Okay, that's a good idea. Right, who's programming this? People. Yeah, but you know what? We, we hired the best people and they're not biased. Okay. So let's, let's assume for a moment that we hire really cool, unbiased individuals that are going to create unbiased algorithms. Now, now, we all know that machine learning needs two things, right? Algorithms and what? Data. Oh, where do we get data? Oh, the world's full of data. Oh, is that data unbiased? Uh, no. Oh, too bad. So let's feed these machine learning algorithms with unbiased data. And what are you are going to get? Biased machine learning biased AI and there are numerous examples of this. Here is one. This was basically an algorithm to detect who is the criminal, right? Nine out of ten times it would say, oh, the black person is the criminal, even though they weren't. Why? Because they've been fed with data like that. I don't know if you heard of a Twitter account, I can't remember her name, was it Tanya or what, Tate? Tate or something? Microsoft decided to create a Twitter bot that was artificial intelligence. It said, hello world, right? In a couple of hours, it was shouting, you piece of shit Nazi, and oh, let's go kill all these people, and let's all kill the gays, and all of this stuff. It was shouting left and right. Why? Because it was engaging with the data. And people were like, oh, let's troll the crap out of this account. <laughs> they had to shut it down. It was called Tate, I think it was. It's still now, if you go to Twitter, the account is protected. So you're saying, okay, we are screwed, this isn't getting better, well, so what should we do? I don't know. Like, thanks, anyway, it was a great day. No, so what should we do? I don't know, but I think that we need to think about a few things. First of all, we need to move towards a more sustainable model. And I'm starting to see this, and I'm starting to be glad that we're moving a little bit towards this. I'm liking that actually information outlets are starting to say, you know what, I'm going to start charging you money for giving you information. Because this is not sustainable. Because if the only thing that media outlets can create a sustainable model is by clickbait, it's just going to go downhill. So for our privacy, we need to move to a more sustainable model. For our well-being, we need to move to a more sustainable model. Not only financially, but also emotionally. We need to start to think about what it is that we're sharing. We need to start to think and contrast information. And for society, we need to move to a more sustainable model, where we're not just freely giving information and sharing information. And we need to, as individuals, not only as developers, not only as having a part in this role, we need to be responsible. And we need to be responsible by raising awareness. We need to tell people around us, those that are, of us that are more tech savvy around this, all of the consequences of what is happening. I've explained this to my mother, I've explained this to my family, I've explained this to people that don't know that actually there are algorithms behind all of this that are moving you towards more engaging, controversial content. We need to raise awareness about this thing. And we need to kind of find ways to impact positively society. We need to think about what we do before acting on it. Before we share that Facebook post, before we share that tweet, take the time to actually contrast things. If you don't have the time, then stop doing it. Just stop. Stop just sharing information. Stop saying, you know, it's other people that are responsible for fake news. We are all content generators. We are all responsible for what is happening. If it's not for us, sh fake news, sure the bots will do their job as well, but we are all partially responsible for all of this as well. So, we are not only consumers of this. We are the creators, and we're not only creators because we are developers or what have you. We are creators because we are taking part in all of these things that are happening in one shape, way or form. And I'll end with Jeff Goldblum's quote from Jurassic Park. He says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And that is exactly what we are doing in society. Thank you.
So, do I get my elephant now? Oh, just give a picture. Oh, <laughs> with my elephant. You can get two. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you want to, this is yours, I think. Yeah, yeah, probably. You, you want to take some questions, though? No? Oh, do I want to, no. Uh, any questions? No. No. They're all good. They just want to go home and have a beer.